So I would say, uh, let's get started. Welcome everyone to the Casus Institute seminar today. Um, and today I'm pleased to introduce our speaker, who's Jan Nickel. Um, and let me introduce uh, Jan to you briefly, if you don't know him. So Jan completed his education in computational physics uh, with a bachelor's and master's degree from the Czech Technical University in Prague, where he also went on to obtain his PhD. Um, his doctoral research focused on modeling of non-local energy transport in laser plasma. And since October last year, Jan uh, has been working with us uh, as a postdoctoral researcher. Uh, his work he will talk about today, but his work uh, as an overview centers on computational techniques for studying processes in laser coupled, uh, in laser produced plasmas. Um, and that includes hybrid continuum kinetic modeling and magnetohydrodynamics. Um, so, with that, um, I'll hand over to Jan and we look forward to hearing more about your research. Okay, thank you for the word. And so the topic today is plasma as a fluid and hydrodynamic simulations of uh, laser matter interaction. And this is the outline of the presentation. And we are going to start with a brief introduction to the topic. And uh, then we will move uh, to the theoretical description of the dynamics of fluids and uh, the foundations of uh, the numerical. Model. Uh, then we will get also to some additional models, uh, like for energy transport or some advanced techniques like arbitrary Lagrangian or Lagrangian methods. And finally, there are some examples of simulations and summary. So, what is plasma? Uh, plasma uh, is the fourth state of matter. Uh, how we may read, so for example, in Britannica. Uh, and actually, it's the most abundant uh, form of matter in, in our universe. Uh, unlike other states, uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's uh, made of charged particles, uh, but uh, they don't behave just like individual ones, but they manifest some kind of collective behavior. Uh, Oops. Uh, and we might have uh, many different uh, types of plasmas from cold to very hot uh, or from dense like uh, uh, the interiors of uh, planets uh, to just very low density plasmas like ionosphere and so on. Okay, so when we know what is plasma uh, then what is fluid? Uh, fluid is something that flows when uh, pressure is applied on it. So we are going to talk about dynamics of fluid because fluids are almost completely uh, are in motion. Uh, second important thing is uh, fluid, uh, fluids are continuum. So from the mathematical point of view, we may differentiate them uh, anywhere uh, on arbitrary neighborhood. Uh, but our physical intuition says us this is probably not absolutely valid. Uh, so on some scale, uh, we may already see uh, like that in, uh, collection of that individual particles. So for that fluid description, we are going to talk only about the scales uh, uh, where uh, the charge of individual uh, uh, species is screened already and uh, also where, where we have like a thermodynamic response uh, mediated by sufficient number of uh, collisions between the particles. And with such uh, assumptions, what's very beautiful about this theory is that it applies on very small scales as well as on very large scales. So we have two pictures here which look almost the same. But on the left, we have 
collapse of a supernova with a scale 10 to 7 uh, centimeters. And on the right, we have a pellet of uh, thermonuclear fuel uh, during an inertial confinement fusion experiment in size just of uh, tens of microns. Uh, okay, so when we know what is plasma and fluid, we may get to uh, the theoretical description of fluids and their dynamics. Uh, and first of all, we need to choose uh, between uh, the Eulerian description and Lagrangian description. And no, it's not about maybe a possible personal uh, dispute between two gentlemen, but about the question how to describe uh, continuum mechanics. So uh, in that Eulerian picture, uh, we use the laboratory frame, which is static, while in the Lagrangian uh, framework, we uh, rather take uh, that fluid frame, which is closer uh, to actual uh, invariant uh, formulation of hydrodynamics, uh, like in relativ relativistic plasmas. Uh, for these reasons, uh, the Eulerian description better suits uh, maybe turbulent flows, uh, while that uh, Lagrangian one uh, is more suitable for uh, problems with strong compression or expansion. And when we stay true to uh, this formalism, also when uh, discretizing uh, the problem, we typically use uh, then static meshes for, for Eulerian methods and commoving uh, meshes with the flow of the material or uh, uh, that Lagrangian curves. Uh, in, the, in the case of the Eulerian methods, uh, we then need something like uh, mesh refinement, typically uh, to increase resolutions, uh, resolution at the, uh, at the places uh, of, uh, for example, propagating shock waves, where we might run into problems with load balancing. This is not the case for Lagrangian methods, which do not suffer from this problem. Uh, but because uh, that resolution automatically increases uh, with compression also of that computational mesh. Uh, but uh, we might have problems with uh, integration of other uh, physical models, uh, like typically some transport models, which I'm going to talk about, uh, which uh, uh, mm, uh, um, may, may suffer from, from the severely distorted meshes. And at some point we might run, run into also problems uh, with the, the, this mesh entangling. Uh, and we could follow uh, uh, this discussion uh, for much longer, but uh, in general, I would say there's no clear winner between these two and very much depends uh, on that actual problem at hand, uh, which one uh, is more suitable for you. So for the rest of the presentation, uh, we are going to stay uh, with the Lagrangian hydrodynamics, where we describe the plasma as inviscid, compressible, and quasi-neutral fluid. And in that Lagrangian formulation, we include uh, that convective der derivative uh, directly into what is known as material derivative, Lagrangian or substantial uh, derivative. And uh, on top of that, uh, we use uh, the two temperature uh, model because uh, just due to basic uh, mechanics of collisions, electrons rather exchange energy again with electrons and ions with ions uh, longer bef uh, long before uh, they uh, co converge to single equilibrium, they rather uh, equilibrate between themselves. So uh, we then have different temperatures for electrons and ions. And with that, we formulate that Euler equations which describe uh, the, uh, the dynamics uh, of uh, such plasma fluid. Uh, 
so we have the equation of mass conservation with mass density rho and velocity, average velocity uh, u, and then momentum equation uh, with pressures uh, p and two separate uh, energy equations for electrons and ions. Um, epsilon is the specific uh, internal energy. And G is then uh, the temperature relaxation coefficient, which is given by a collision frequency closure model. Plus we have uh, an equation of state that defines uh, the relation uh, of the temperature and density to pressure or uh, the internal energy. Okay, so that's the basic dynamics, but what if we have uh, an external magnetic field or uh, a magnetic field is self-generated in the plasma? Well, such situations are very common actually, and due to the charged particles, we end up with magnetized plasma. But even when we keep that assumption of uh, quasi-neutrality, we still might have uh, such uh, electric currents uh, in plasma, which are purely solenoidal uh, with zero divergence, uh, or in common language, we may call them eddy currents. Uh, and actually, uh, mm, the magnetic field can be directly generated in the plasma uh, by the mechanisms of Biermann battery, for example, uh, which is just due to misaligned gradients of density and temperature. And this magnetic field can be then amplified by many orders of magnitude by the mechanism of magnetohydrodynamic dynamo, like in nebular plasmas, or there are other examples like uh, an accretion disk or geodynamo inside our planet. And returning back to laboratory plasmas, uh, uh, it gets us back to the question of where we may use that Eulerian approach and Lagrangian. So Eulerian uh, magnetohydrodynamics is a standard tool uh, for magnetic confinement fusion uh, for simulations of the interior of uh, tokamaks, uh, while uh, the Lagrangian uh, methods uh, yeah, uh, are applied typically in the inter uh, inertial confinement fusion uh, where uh, lasers uh, irradiate uh, a little pellet of fusion material uh, which is being compressed by the ablative pressure and eventually also ignited. Okay. So uh, how does the uh, theoretical model uh, change when we include uh, the magnetohydrodynamics? Uh, first of all, we need to distinguish between uh, that ideal and presence magnetohydrodynamics. And with the ideal, uh, the situation is relatively simple. We have just this uh, additional uh, magnetic stress tensor appearing in the momentum equation, and then we have just pure convection of uh, the magnetic field, which is uh, in uh, the Lagrangian framework, uh, just described by zero uh, derivative. Uh, and that's pretty much all. Uh, but uh, the situation gets more involved uh, when we have resistive electric field in the fluid frame, which is given uh, by uh, uh, the Ohm's law uh, like this, and it contributes uh, to the Faraday's law uh, and induces actually the magnetic field. And also uh, we have a contribution uh, to that energy equation through a dual heating. Uh, it's also, uh, Worth, worth of that effort uh, to formulate uh, the energy uh, uh, that equation for magnetic energy, uh, uh, which is nearly symmetrical to that fluid energy uh, energy equation. It's just dual 
term to the dual heating here and might give us some insights into the physics and also helps us this formulation uh, of uh, conserving uh, numerical methods. But in fact, it's already implicitly given uh, by the Faraday's law here. Okay. So uh, this knowledge of uh, that physical model, you may get uh, already to uh, construction of the numerical model. And the method of choice here is the finite element method. So uh, if uh, you haven't heard about it, or if uh, you don't remember the, the university courses, there is a little crash course on it. So we consider the simplest, probably the simplest possible PDE, which is like Laplace or some problem with a Dirichlet uh, boundary condition. And then we multiply the equation uh, by a test function uh, uh, and perform integration over the domain. Uh, then uh, we may reformulate uh, the system using the uh, the weak uh, uh, formal uh, yeah in, in the weak sense uh, and when applying that Green's theorem here we may drop actually this term when we realize that we don't we don't perform variations uh, at the boundaries due to that Dirichlet boundary condition. Uh, then we may choose some appropriate suitable spaces for this problem, like H1, for example, and include some uh, essential boundary conditions uh, like this uh, Dirichlet boundary conditions. So already due to the definition, all functions from this space will have zero boundary. And uh, then we proceed with, uh, in our case, conforming discretization for simplicity and classical Kalerkin method, uh, which, mean, which means uh, that we approximate uh, the function uh, by, uh, by a polynomial function uh, from a subspace of the original uh, functional space. And then uh, we expand uh, the function uh, to uh, a linear combination of uh, the basis functions. And uh, what we may recognize here is this is actually a uh, matrix multiplication, and we have a discrete vector on the right hand side. So we then use uh, a linear solver of choice uh, to solve such discrete, discrete problem. What I haven't mentioned so far is that we typically want to restrict somehow the support of the of the basis functions, uh, which mean which means that we will obtain then a sparse matrix. Uh, so for that, uh, we split the computational domain by tessellation uh, to uh, connect that uh, finite elements. Uh, as uh, the name of the method uh, already says. And what are advantages of the finite element method? Uh, first of all, arbitrary order of the elements. So uh, it was pretty much just, an, just a parameter here. Uh, and they can be also easily formulated uh, on different shapes of the elements. So uh, we may have even unstructured meshes, but I'm not going to, to talk about that much here. Uh, but another point is uh, they not nicely play with HPC uh, because we can typically achieve um, big scaling uh, of our methods. And what is maybe the most important from the physical point of view is that they satisfy what is known as the round complex, which means that the discrete spaces uh, are uh, related uh, uh, by uh, some discrete differential operators which traverse between them exactly. Uh, so in that way, uh, they mimic uh, the properties of that actual differential operator. And in the end, 
the properties uh, they keep the properties of the uh, the PDEs and you know, the nature of uh, the physics uh, at hand. Another technique uh, which we may use here are curvilinear finite elements. So first of all, we should realize that integration doesn't take place in the physical space uh, uh, as we could uh, think uh, initially, uh, but actually it's always reformulated uh, to integration in the reference space uh, where that reference uh, element is typically just a unit uh, square or some similar and we then transform this uh, uh, shape to the physical space uh, by a mapping uh, with Jacobi matrix J here. And we may utilize uh, this formalism even further and replace this simple uh, mapping by something more sophisticated, uh, uh, like uh, in the case of uh, isoparametric finite elements, which use the same polynomial uh, mapping as uh, uh, as um, you know, also the, the functions for, for interpolation of, of uh, that approximate with quantities, uh, and then we we can see we, we may obtain even such nicely curved uh, finite elements. The only trouble here is that uh, the, in, the numerical integration is no longer exact because even with Gauss quadratures, uh, what we have obtained here is a non polynomial integrand. Uh, so we cannot be sure we have the exact answer here. Uh, and the related problem is that it's very hard to uh, theoretically prove convergence of such methods. On the other hand, from the, new, from the physical perspective, uh, such methods are very convenient because they uh, may nicely track uh, some propagating discontinuities or free boundaries, uh, like uh, in the case of that Rayleigh-Taylor Taylor instability on the right, where you may see uh, even very distorted, uh, very long finite elements here. And they also satisfy uh, what is known as strong mass conservation. Uh, uh, so we don't need to restrict uh, uh, the uh, mass conservation only to some finite volumes, but uh, it holds at every single point uh, due to this uh, differential uh, relation, which we may uh, derive with some effort. And this is the basis of uh, the high order curvilinear hydrodynamics, as it was proposed you know, some years ago uh, by the Livermore group. And it's also the basis of their uh, code uh, BLAST, which is used for uh, simulations of uh, inertial confinement fusion experiments uh, in Livermore. And this group has also developed uh, uh, an open source finite element library, which helps us actually with construction of such uh, methods. Uh, and it's freely available. And in fact, it's uh, part of uh, multiple projects from Exascale computing project. And actually for a good reason, because it offers many different Offers many different uh, finite element spaces and uh, different types of finite elements, also different meshes uh, and some advanced techniques, and also it's uh, it's paralyzed uh, using MPI classically or different backends uh, like for Huda, Raja, Oka, and other, and also we have. Uh, uh, many solvers uh, from packages like Hyper, Betsy, Suit, Pars, and so on. And based on this library, I have uh, developed uh, the multidimensional code P2, uh, 
which uses different uh, high order curvilinear finite elements for different quantities. So we have the thermodynamic, kinematic, magnetic, and electric finite elements. But without getting into any details, uh, let me just mention how uh, uh, how the finite elements of the lowest orders look like uh, in 2D and 3D and with increasing order uh, also then uh, the uh, complexity of, of these layouts increases proportionally. Uh, again, without getting into in any details, this is then the discrete uh, uh, set of equations which we actually solve. And what we, you may recognize here are some very nice uh, symmetries uh, between the equations, uh, which in turn uh, lead to some very nice properties of the numerical scheme, like divergence-free structure of the magnetic field, arbitrary order of convergence, at least for smooth problems, uh, strong mass conservation, as we have already mentioned, uh, and conservation of momentum, magnetic flux, and energy, and also uh, implicit magnetic or electric field diffusion. So we are not limited by uh, the, the, the magnitude of these fields, and uh, also high order time integration. And what we can do with such code, uh, for example, on the left, you may see an HD rotor. So it's a cylinder which uh, slows down uh, due to emission of torsional uh, magnetic alphanic waste. Uh, and on the right, it's uh, uh, a glass or explosion in a strong external magnetic field, which then induces a strong asymmetry of the problem. Okay, so that was about the, the dynamics, uh, but how about some transport of momentum or energy, especially, or exchange? Uh, and of course, for laser plasma and other applications, we need uh, multiple uh, additional closure models, like, for example, heat transport, or radiation transport, laser absorption, of course, uh, or it could be also combustion or uh, some chemical reactions or even that thermonuclear fusion. Uh, we don't have really time to go through all of them, but uh, let, uh, let me just mention the first one. Uh, and when talking about the heat transport, we should start uh, with nothing else than uh, the kinetic equation for electrons. So on the left, we have the classical Vlasov part. On the right, we have a specified collision operator. And then when we apply uh, the diffusion approximation, which means uh, that we have uh, just uh, the local uh, Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution plus a little uh, deviation from it, which is proportional uh, to the mean free pass of electrons. And when we ignore uh, for, for the moment uh, magnetic fields, uh, we may then derive the classical uh, result uh, for Lorentz gas, or when we include electron electron scattering, we get that numerical result of Spitzer and Herm back from uh, 50s. And uh, this then determines the heat conductivity here, and the heat conduction is then governed by these two equations. You may then again apply some high order finite elements, and without getting into details here, uh, let me just mention we, we might have even local uh, conservation properties. Uh, of those and uh, what we might have a problem with is uh, minimal of value theorem. But okay, but maybe uh, let's consider a different situation. What if what uh, happens when we actually have that magnetic field? 
In that case, following the classical Braginsky theory, uh, the heat flux is rather uh, given by this formula. So instead of the scalar the heat conductivity, we have rather a tensor here, and also this uh, thermoelectric uh, term. And uh, it's not only ab ab about asymmetry in that sense that we would have uh, uh, much stronger uh, heat conduction in one direction than in the other, uh, like uh, on this picture on the left, but with increasing uh, strength of the anti-symmetric part, uh, uh, that magnetic field uh, then steers uh, the, the heat flux around, and we may observe what is known as regular duke or uh, whole, whole effect for heat flux, uh, uh, which uh, at some point may even lead to such picture where we have the heat flux almost perpendicular uh, to the gradient of temperature. And this also means uh, some, uh, um, we have some uh, numerical challenges here. But uh, another problem could be uh, with the diffusion approximation already, uh, because you might wonder how long this is valid. And actually, uh, in laser plasma especially, uh, very often it's not valid. Uh, to quantify that, we may define uh, the Knudsen number for electrons, which is the ratio between the mean free pass and uh, local length scale. And a uh, uh, well-known result is that when this number increases from a certain point, uh, the heat conductivity compared to classical diffuse, diffusion one that should very rapidly uh, drop. So uh, back in the 70s, it was proposed to use flux limiters to limit such heat fluxes. Uh, based on the free streaming flux value. Uh, but trouble is uh, such limiters are a problem and in the most uh, complex scenarios also time dependent. And also uh, fundamentally the problem here is uh, the free streaming value depends rather on the temperature uh, than uh, on uh, the Knudsen number. Uh, uh, so that's fundamentally wrong. For that reason, it was later proposed to uh, use convolution models, and then uh, there is the multidimensional transport equation uh, as part of the famous SMP model. But as it turns out, these are actually unstable. Uh, and this led us to uh, formulation also of one of the models, which is known as PGK SN like model, maybe, uh, but there are uh, many other. Uh, okay, uh, another question might be uh, what happens when we increase that intensity even further, like in the case of laser ion acceleration or fast ignition and so on how we can actually define even that electron temperature or uh, can we actually find any equilibrium there? Well, uh, of course, uh, this is very problematic and uh, uh, the situation can be better described uh, by greater population of hot electrons uh, and some relatively cold uh, background and uh, the interaction is then a complex interplay of different collision less and collision uh, effects uh, inside the target and also outside of it uh, partially. And now for this reason, uh, we have proposed uh, to use uh, kind of hybrid modeling where we combine particle approach uh, for hot uh, anisotropic species 
uh, which are treated by the particle in cell method. And uh, that continuum background electrons are rather treated uh, by, for example, uh, the reduced plus of Popper Planck Maxwell model, which I have developed. Uh, and on the right, you might see uh, such interaction, but we don't have time to go into details here. And another thing I'm working on now is arbitrary Lagrangian Eulerian method. So as we know already from that introduction, we might run into the problem that uh, at some point our mesh uh, gets severely uh, distorted and might even get uh, entangled, which uh, forces us to repeat that computational step and uh, shorten uh, the time step, which at some point might lead even you know, to uh, the crash of, uh, of the simulation. Uh, to, some, to some extent, this problem is alleviated by uh, use of uh, that curvilinear finite elements, but uh, we still cannot totally uh, avoid that uh, final uh, uh, evolution. Uh, so we need something like that arbitrary Lagrangian Euler variant method, which means uh, that we perform one or multiple Lagrangian steps, and then uh, we perform rezoning, which somehow regularizes the computational mesh, uh, followed uh, by the step of remapping, where we map the quantities from the old mesh uh, to the new one. The rezoning, again, is about its, uh, regularization or untangling. Uh, and the simplest approach is just like smoothing the mesh. But that doesn't really help us uh, in the cases of uh, severely distorted meshes, especially high order curvilinear meshes. So we need something more uh, sophisticated, like uh, that target matrix optimization paradigm. In this case, we define uh, the target, which is like an ideal shape, for example, a rectangle, or it could be somehow analytically given or discreetly given. And it's mapping from the reference, uh, reference space. Uh, as we know already, if you have also that mapping from the reference space to the physical space, so with some uh, algebra, we may calculate then the mapping between the target and the, the actual element in the physical space. And based on the Jacobi matrix uh, of this transformation, we may define uh, the metric, uh, which is based on some matrix invariants, which uh, somehow reflect uh, the property we want to optimize, like the shape of that elements, or their size, and we try to then optimize this total integral over the whole domain, eventually with some shape limiting to cross maybe some, some boundaries. Uh, and we do, we do so uh, with, uh, with variational formulation, so we rather minimize uh, the derivative of this, integral here with uh, the classic Newton method, for example. So we uh, proceed like this, where H is then the Hessian matrix uh, for, the, for the matrix. And uh, we have steps C here. Uh, the steps are then given by the remapping phase. So as we know already, it's about mapping the quantities from the old mesh to the new mesh. So physically, the physical space, we want to keep the quantities at the same, uh, at the same place, uh, but when the mapping changes. So we may look at it also that way that uh, when we move the mesh, uh, we want to calculate the counterfluxes of the quantity which are induced by this artificial motions. So this, has, this then uh, leads us to the uh, pseudo-Eulerian uh, convection, 
So it's pretty much like classical Eulerian perfection, just with the only uh, distinction here that uh, we have the opposite sign here. Uh, so uh, and this is the measure we have here. And this then gives, uh, gives us the CFL condition, like in the case of classical uh, convection. So the CFL condition says that we shouldn't cross uh, multiple cells during a single step of propagation. So we limit uh, that step uh, to just cross a certain fraction of the displacement. And this determines the steps in that optimization uh, in the Newton method, uh, which we uh, saw before. Okay, that was uh, remapping of classical quantities, but uh, uh, the situation with the magnetic field is uh, much more involved. Uh, and that's due to the fact that we want to uh, satisfy uh, all these criteria. So the, it's like conservation of magnetic flux, which we would like to keep. Uh, also, we would like to keep the divergence free structure of the field and conservation of uh, magnetic energy as part of total energy. And it would be nice to have also balance preservation from the physical point of view and non dispersive. Uh, nature of, of, the, uh, of this convection. And I may tell you this is nearly impossible. Uh, so uh, we want to get uh, as close uh, to this goal as possible. Uh, so we performed it remapping in a consistent way with Lorentz uh, or non-relativistic uh, approximation of Lorentz transformation, or we may look at it as Reynolds uh, transport theorem for solenoidal fields. So that means that we uh, update the magnetic field in this sense. Uh, and then the trick is with the higher the finite elements uh, that we split it the calculation of uh, the, the, the electric field responsible uh, for the for, for that convection of the magnetic field and apply that uh, finite element machinery only on uh, the calculation of the electric field where uh, we uh, use the trick of upwinding uh, so basically it means when we want to propagate the quantity from left to right we take the uh, the magnetic field only from the left, so only from the upstream, which makes a lot of sense also. Uh, also from the physical point of view. And then that update of magnetic field is uh, done discreetly thanks to the properties of uh, the finite elements and the DRAM scheme. Okay, there are some examples. So what happens without that upwinding? Uh, when we have set distorted mesh and we would like to uh, regularize that mesh, well, after 392 iterations, the simulation pretty much blows up. Uh, so it's completely unstable. So maybe better idea would be to perform low order uh, remapping, but on uh, uh, more refined mesh. Uh, which resembles like classical methods in this field. Uh, well, the result is relatively reasonable, but- What is this color varies? What it represents? Uh, this is the magnetic field perpendicular to the plane. Oh, okay. I mean, the, the values are arbitrary, arbitrary units, let's say. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And after, uh, yeah, some iterations, you may see we, we have, uh, regularized the, the mesh, uh, but we have completely lost the internal structure of this profile. And also we see some slight asymmetries here. And so the values are much lower. So better idea is to perform high order uh, remapping this upwinding, which is stable. And you may see uh, 
preserved that internal or in that central clip here very nicely. We have also nice symmetry. Just there are some slight local variations and some slight local overshoots. So there is still something to work on. Uh, but otherwise, the solution is relatively nice. Okay, so what is this all good for? Uh, there are some examples of simulations. So uh, currently, there is an effort to simulate uh, the experimental campaigns uh, at Pulse facility and also SG2 uh, facility in China. And later this year, we should get also uh, to simulations of uh, the experiments at Omega uh, uh, inertial confinement fusion facility in Rochester. Um, and uh, this example is for aluminum uh, 10 micron foil, uh, where you may see that almost at the end of the laser pulse, you know, that's the plasma. Uh, is ablated and also the material of the foil collapses and the plasma heats up significantly. From the uh, numerical point of view, the, the advantage of the uh, Lagrangian finite elements. So we need just like 20 times 40 uh, quadratic uh, uh, finite elements to. Uh, describe these profiles and you may see that smooth interpolation of the quantities inside. After five nanoseconds, uh, the expansion progresses significantly, uh, but what we are mostly interested in uh, is rather the rear side uh, where the material prolapses uh, and uh, this forms like plasma jets or plasma outflows, uh, where uh, the still bulk material has velocity on about 100 kilometers per second, which makes it relevant to the um, uh, astrophysical studies or uh, studies related to the inertial confinement fusion. Okay, now the summary. Uh, so uh, we have introduced uh, um, what is actually plasma uh, and what it's uh, a theoretical description in terms of uh, magnetohydrodynamics. And uh, so uh, we have built the numerical foundations uh, of the, our models. Uh, and uh, also we have mentioned some of the uh, more advanced uh, techniques and closure models. And finally, there were some example simulations. And uh, my future work in, is then work on that uh, magnetohydrodynamic Ailey methods uh, with my former supervisor, Milan Kuchařík. Uh, then also collaboration with Tim on the first principle equations of state. Uh, and the hybrid model link uh, together with the Bitcoin GPU team at AZDR, and also uh, uh, modeling of the experimental campaigns of plasma jets uh, uh, in collaboration with uh, uh, the group of Katia Falk and uh, others. And that's all from my side. Thank you very much, Jan, for your very nice talk and overview of um, magnetohydrodynamics and related methods. Um, so we have some time for uh, Q and A. So let's let's open this up. Um, any questions from the audience? Hello and one thought. I maybe I start with a question. Uh, maybe a little bit more like like offensive one. Um, you said you you want to model with these hydrodynamics to plasmas and that yeah you do or, or you do that. Um, and the question is when you go to relativistic plasma, so relativistic energies of the charged particles in the plasma, is there something like a 
relativistically invariant formulation of fluids to yeah. make it like correct. Yeah, th there is yeah. very certainly, and, and that Lagrangian, as I mentioned in the introduction, uh, that Lagrangian description is much closer to it logically because yeah, it's yeah. like in that fluid frame. Uh, but this these models are typically used in in astrophysical context. Uh, it doesn't make that much sense in the uh, in the context of laboratory plasmas or laser plasmas, especially. Why? Why not? Uh, because uh, for relativistic plasmas, you might have relativistic velocities. Yes. Uh, even uh, this uh, relatively uh, or close, relatively cold plasmas, relatively close to equilibrium. Yeah. Uh, but it's not usually the case in in laboratory plasmas or laser plasmas, especially, uh, because usually you break uh, the the. the that assumption of, of uh, local equilibrium much uh, longer before uh, you reach really that relativistic velocities. Oh, okay. So uh, yeah, that's that's why that's also one of the reasons to to develop that uh, hybrid model mm -hmm. uh, because we simply cannot reach that uh, regime. Uh, uh, relativistic uh, interaction. So uh, yeah, for example, for these simulations, we combined uh, that hydro with particle in cell, mm -hmm. uh, but only in that sense that we ran, first of all, the hydro with still reasonable intensities of the laser. And then actually we had to skip certain, uh, certain part because uh, there is pretty much no way how to simulate that intermediate intensities mm -hmm. on the picosecond scale, which is too long for, uh, for a particle in cell. And directly we had to jump uh, to the yeah, high intensities and relativistic uh, interaction uh, of, of uh, the main pulse and uh, uh, the, the particle in cell modeling. Uh, so yeah, it's not ideal, uh, uh, and yeah, we would need something like that hybrid modeling here. Uh, it could be self also yeah, could be uh, viewed from that point of view the relativistic interaction, but uh, yeah, it's rather uh, rather about that equilibrium, which is mm -hmm. the okay. So 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 it is actually tightly bounded to the equilibrium uh, assumption you made. For hydrodynamics, because I was uh, thinking about in this direction, but also like about uh, like uh, uh, really old Ehrenfest, uh, uh, yeah, Ehrenfest work uh, where they showed that like there is no solid solid states in a way in a relativistic regime. So this is not possible because this is not you can't formulate it with the standard mm -hmm. uh, special relativity equations, and this was like. A bit of my my the back of my head that, mm -hmm. that you need some kind of a of a general relativistic formulation of a solid when you want to have the solid with mm -hmm. letters and so on in a relativistic regime. Uh -huh. and it is a really really old statement and uh, maybe it drove him crazy or so. But uh, in the end, uh, it means that when you have like something like 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 forces which forces a thing into a structure and you want to do relativistic movements with it, you need to generally formulate it. Mm -hmm. and you can't use SOT anymore. Uh, that's, that's what was like where the question was going, but mm -hmm. you're right. If there is no equilibrium, then you can't uh, <laughs> use the the, uh, the hydrodynamics models anyway. So so and then, and then these things kick in, and then maybe look like a small a small uh, additional question which goes in the same direction for the uh, hybrid models is uh, is there actually a, a hard uh, upper limit upper boundary for the Intensity you can model with this. Is it hybrid model? Yes. Well, the idea was that uh, we could smoothly transit, like from the nearly just continuum mm -hmm. uh, modeling, full particle modeling. Yes. So, yeah, as you know, in particle modeling, there is almost no limit. It can be relatively formulated. Uh, yeah, but it may include also I would say a, maybe uh, uh, for particles. I would say there's a lower limit, so you need at least a certain amount of, of intensity to to make it like work properly. 
for that particular sample. Yes. Well, yeah, and yeah, that's where you have that continuum. Yeah. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. But, but is there is there any argument uh, that you can that you can give where this like boundary is? So, so is there any physical like property where like the the uh, transition between continuum and particles will, will, will go? Well, certainly. Uh, well. Yeah. I've already spent some time on on this model, like that's three years ago. Uh, it's pretty complex things to okay. things to, to, to define the transition. Mm -hmm. I may tell you, uh, but the basic things uh, we have there is that uh, that energy of the particle. So typically, that ener uh, high energy tail of the distribution function will. Mm -hmm. Deviate most uh, the most from uh, from equilibrium because they have these species have the lowest uh, collisionality. Mm -hmm. uh, so usually you want to cut that tail mm -hmm. and keep just uh, in that continuum that bulk, okay. so low energies. Um, but there are other criteria. So uh, typically it can be critical density. Because you don't want to cross cross it, because under dense plasma can very abruptly and directly interact with the laser, so also that or directly upon the remote potential, because there might be strong fields somehow and uh, so on. Uh, but yeah, maybe the basic picture is that you want to split the dis distribution function, so maybe uh, yeah. That energies, that's one thing, and another thing is anisotropy. So this for that continuum, I used reduced force over Maxwell. So that mean means that I used just the first two uh, or zeros and first uh, spherical harmonic. So I couldn't describe that higher anisotropy. Uh, so again, that particle itself uh, take over there and treat with anisotropic species. So that's another okay. So, so it means there's no no such a thing like an order parameter or something like that. You can calculate and say, okay, if this one is like in the order of well, I never I need to right to do the oh, okay, okay. <laughs> but, I mean there yeah, there are multiple different things oh, okay. in the concept of and yeah. Okay, I'm still fine. Maybe a related question. I'm on, on, on roughly on this topic. So you mentioned at the end, um, or in general, for magnetic hydrodynamics, um, you can inform it with um, high accurate data, like equation of state data. Um, and I'm curious here for the hybrid modeling, um, in particular, the Vlasov fokker planck method, uh, can you inform it with first principles data? Um, on the electrons or atoms, and what would be the quantities you would need? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, uh, yeah, that's that's a good point. <laughs> uh, uh, and yeah, we have a little bit discussed that, but maybe also for others. Uh, yeah, uh, sure. So um, for the kinetic model, like the Blaster Fokker Punk Maxwell, I need still a kind of closure model in the sense of uh, the model of collision frequency. So uh, typically it's uh, it's just based on, on spitzer uh the classical result of uh, result of spitzer uh, But uh, yeah, I mean, for, for uh, the applications like with the high intensities of the lasers, usually we do need to care that much about so, so state physics and so on. So that's typically sufficient. But when we would like to look at uh, some complex uh, interaction uh, close to close to that solid regime and possibly also warm dense matter, then of course it uh, would be worth of that effort to to. Try to include uh, some first principle uh, models there. So uh, it would have to be, yeah, like collision frequency. They're single uh, or single, well, electron, electron, and electron ion collision frequency. Uh, 
uh, which is resolved in that whole uh, energy space. So it wouldn't be like that average one, but really energy resolved. So uh, yeah, this this is also a challenge, as I understood, to, to get uh, such model out of uh, the first principle models. Uh, or to train neural networks on, on that uh, would mean another dimension, basically. Uh, so, yeah, the parametric space would be huge then. But, uh, yeah, in the longer term, it would be interesting, definitely. Uh, do you know, for example, you said collision frequencies. So, you know, do you know in your simulation then in which Mm, energy range you would need them is that always clear or would uh, it be yeah that's also another good point <laughs> well like this classical loss of poker plant maxwell the, the computational mesh is is euler -in. so uh it's fixed uh in space and typically also in that velocity but uh yeah so in that case it would be relatively easy but the thing is, uh, this is far from optimal because, yeah, as we mentioned, you have cold plasma and very hot plasma. And uh, with, when you have static mesh, you need to have such good resolution to resolve both at the same time. And most of the time, you're actually wasting that computational time because, uh, yeah, you don't have any plasma in, in some part or uh, yeah, the, the other way around. Uh, so, uh, but people in Los Alamos, Livermore, and elsewhere are interested in is some kind of adaptivity also in that energy space. So something like maybe even Lagrangian methods, uh, but not uh, only in, in uh, the configuration space. Uh, but also in, in that velocity or energy space. So, uh, and yeah, in that case, it, uh, we wouldn't be able to say in advance uh, what energy we, we would need. But yeah, probably we could do some interpolation, maybe. Uh, and again, maybe the neural networks would help us with that. Yeah, something like that, I guess. Okay, thanks. Any other questions for Jan? Uh, I mean, like you are not using viscosity in your calculations, right? Uh, oh, and viscosity will impact like the, the heat transport, right? I mean, it, it will affect the energy in the system. It uh, will be coupled yes. with the energy equation, right? It's true that I model it as a uh, uh, um, or without any any viscosity, that's true. Yeah. Okay. But in principle, the models uh, can include viscosity. It's just that uh, the yeah, the classic equations of state I used they don't provide uh, anything for that. But in principle, I can include. Uh, no, but yeah. impact will not be much. I think that is why you have neglected. For it. plasma, it's negligible. That's why we why we yeah ignore it or neglect it. Mm -hmm. uh, but closer to that solid regime, yeah, and the warm dense matter, that's maybe a different story. So, uh, and yeah, for for uh, solid materials, uh, the simulations typically include viscosities. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah, I, I could do that. I mean, yeah, it's, numerically, uh, does the seam can handle tensors. So, yeah. as you could see there, uh, I had already magnetic stress tensor, uh, so it would be pretty much just another tensor contribution. Yeah, and like uh, how you are putting conductivity in your system, so, I mean, that's also, uh, yeah, in magnetohydrodynamics, these all terms are given, or these all coefficients are given by closure model. And yeah, that's the problem here. The closure model is not consistent. So we use one model for calculation of conductivity, another for heat conductivity, and another for uh, yeah uh, for the uh, equation of state. Uh, 
So of course, the ideal situation would be uh, if you could really have a single first principle model, uh, which would provide us not only that equation of state, but also the closure models like conductivity. But I think that is hard. I mean, to go from a whole, a whole range to calculate conductivity, uh, you need different yeah. methods, right? Yeah. So we we thought about combining uh, like that first principle, uh, for example, average atom model with some uh, some classical uh, global equation of state, like uh, just rather a simple one is the Thomas Fermi model of uh, mm -hmm. of, uh, oh, yeah, of matter uh, which uh, can cover the, the limits which we are not able to handle uh, like with the first principle models and also has some empirical or some empirical corrections for uh, chemical uh, bonds uh, so, yeah mm -hmm. nice yeah <laughs> Maybe I can ask another question. Is there some time? Oh, okay. yeah. Go uh, ahead. You, you actually you showed uh, that when you do like uh, like transformations of the mesh, like mm -hmm. the regular one, that you can introduce some yeah additional structures. I would call them artifacts, maybe, from the... Uh, and the question is, um, is there any tool or any uh, strategy to actually verify your simulations? That you that you uh, like can but because when, when you do the simulations you see certain structures appearing and then disappearing and then the question is how can you verify that these are not coming from such a like numerical artifact in a way is um, there any plan or strategy or what you can do uh, well yeah that's typically the problem <laughs> uh, sorry about the question and. <laughs> uh, um, yeah, I would say classically uh, the answer is don't use a use Lagrangian simulation as long as you can mm -hmm. because it doesn't doesn't cause that artificial diffusion. But what's worse, that a classical ALI, like you could uh, you could see it on that example. Uh, uh, yes, we know it's this. Yeah. This one yeah. is very diffusive. But what's worse, the diffusion is anisotropic. So mm -hmm. it, it's along the the, the uh, direction of, of uh, motion of the mesh. So the, it's very hard to distinguish what's physical and what's which is a numerical artifact. Mm -hmm. uh, and yeah, this is one uh, one of the reasons or the motivation for developing that high order uh, methods for for that ALE, which do not suffer. Uh, I mean, yeah, there is slight uh, diffusion, but almost do not suffer uh, from uh, from uh, the anisotropic diffusion, uh, and uh, can yeah can uh, keep even some fine structures of the solution. Okay, so, so it means that you that you just try to control as much, as, as best as possible the transformations and. Uh, control like the behavior that you don't introduce something like an artificial diffusion uh, into the simulation. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, but I mean, yeah, like systematically, if you would like to really validate uh, the simulation, uh, that's, that's hard. Uh, probably you could run it with different resolutions, uh, with different uh, setting of that AD, and this will show you if you have some convergence of mm -hmm. diverges. But again, yeah, that is that high order elements. Uh, it does seem to be not an issue uh, anymore. Uh, mm -hmm. it's, it's a rather issue of that classical mm -hmm. methods. Uh, and yeah, I remember such cases. Uh, it was pretty funny actually uh, when, uh, for example, that laser was interacting with the target, and it was still lighting the material from the front side. So. Yeah, okay, I will make the, the simulation box larger. Uh, so yeah, it doesn't doesn't uh, blow away that uh, side of, 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 of the box. But even when I made it like 10 times larger than the spot of the laser, it was still ablighting away the material. <laughs> and it was due to 80. 
because that alien as as it, as the material turns mm -hmm. You know that it was moving a lot the, the mesh there, so it then dragged the the uh, that uh, heat from that heated area mm -hmm. to that cold area, which ablated away uh, the front surface material. So, uh, yeah, such things can really happen. But this classical methods, this high order, uh, I hope that's something different. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, more questions. Final chance. Doesn't look like it. I think we had a good discussion already. So then, thanks again, Jan, for the presentation and for the discussion. Um, and thanks, everyone. <laughs>